Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for the honour of uh, being invited to address this uh, Mount audience. For those of you who have experience in computers, you'll know that hello world is a typical phrase or a test phrase, and uh, I've used this ancient technology to transmit to you in English, hello Mount world, <laughs> in honour of uh, our dear hosts. Um, this has been a challenging presentation to construct, given that it spans an awfully long period of time that needs to be compressed in a very short period of time, which is stating the obvious. But I think what is more important is to distill from this large epoch relevant elements that could be extracted as lessons learned that could possibly apply to some of you. And I know we have a very diverse audience here from those in academia, students, business, and space enthusiasts. So it's a wide audience to appeal to, and I'll try my best to at least deliver something that may be of interest to you, maybe not all of it, but some of it. And in order to do so, um, if you'll allow me just to briefly cover some of the early influential years that um, had an impact on me and contributed to my appreciation of space and adopting it as a uh, profession. And I guess it all began as a very young boy in Australia, in Sydney, um, being inspired... <laughs> by being inspired by that, the Apollo 11 mission, and indeed the entire Apollo mission, um, had a big impact on that little nine-year-old boy sitting on the floor at the uh, school um, while the teachers were showing us an historic event. And it's interesting that in a few years, that will be repeated with the Artemis mission. Um, and so from those early beginnings, I guess I got involved in electronics, radio communications, looked forward to receiving this magazine each month and uh, making experiments and electronic projects, and ultimately getting exposed to radio and satellite services, which ultimately um, became a little sideline activity. While I was at high school, I was making electronic projects, selling them to students, and fixing radios. So the entrepreneur bug and the space and electronics bug started early. And it eventually became a career. I, I enrolled in radio and electronics school, studied uh, electronics and studied this strange communications uh, technology called Morse code, um, which I have to say, I found that very, very difficult. The electronics and radio was easy. This thing was hard. Um, and then I guess I began to appreciate, and especially now, just how far technology has progressed. For example, when I was working as a professional radio officer, as I fledgling initial career. When a ship at sea wanted to send a message, say from the captain to headquarters, the captain would then write a message out on a special slip of paper called a radiogram. And pay attention to this, you will not believe how many steps were involved in getting a message from the sender to the recipient. Not 100 years ago, not 50 years ago, this service existed until 1999. Okay, some of you may not have been born then, but there's a few here that have been breathing when that was around. So up until 1999, ships at sea relied on this technology for distress communications and for commercial communications via Morse code. So after writing it out on this beautiful piece of paper, it would then be handed to a professional called a radio officer on the ship who would then use this to send that message to a coast radio station there would be a person at that coast radio station who would grab that message, acknowledge it, and then assign it to an operator who would then be charged to type that message down on a primitive machine called a typewriter. Some of us will recognize that is. I think there's a few here of a generation that probably never seen one or never used one at least, um, on a piece of paper. So this is typed live on a piece of paper. Then another person would grab that piece of paper take it to another room, and then type it up again onto another machine called a telex machine, or teleprinter. 
and then that would be dispatched to another center, which is the national exchange, all on a special tape with five holes punched in it, five unit tape, transmitted at a blistering speed of uh, 50 board, which is approximately 50 bits per second. And from there, it would be sent to an international exchange. And then finally, from that international exchange, delivered to the recipient as a radio telegram. Now, the speed of that messaging in those days, at Morse code, does anyone have any idea? Uh, it was 20 words per minute. 20 words per minute is equivalent to less than six bits per second. I'll repeat that, six bits per second. So ships at sea for distress communications for those sorts of messages had to rely on a pipeline of six bits per second. So next time you're complaining about how slow your mobile connection is, think about that up until 1999, that was a pretty good speed. Today, it's instant. Keep up with me because this back background is relevant to the space industry and I will come to that. And indeed, this, this bit here as well, I got inspired by aviation at a young age and ultimately got my private pilot license and eventually commercial pilot license. And as a professional pilot, I flew all over Australia, USA, UK, France, even Cyprus. But um, there's one particular flight mission I went on. It was a very early flight mission, not long after I got my commercial pilot's license. Um, and I, I should pause here because you might think, wow, you know, this guy must have had some money. Not necessarily. In Australia in those days, flying by what they call general aviation or light aircraft was cheaper than flying with an airline. Cheaper per seat than with an airline uh, by cost sharing with your friends. So I had a bunch of friends, uh, the six of us, um, in fact, someone suggested, why don't we go and fly to this town called Canoundra? That's not Canawindra, Canoundra. Uh, it's 250, 300 kilometers, depending on um, the route that's taken in air traffic, to attend what was quite common in Australia. Uh, it's called a picnic race, where there's a horse race and you have a picnic there. And in this particular race field, there was a runway strip right in the middle of it and we prearranged to have permission to land there um, so we could land and park the aircraft and sit on the side and watch the horse races. I'm not particularly interested in horse racing, but I was interested in flying, so that was good enough for me to take my friends there. Every pilot is taught, amongst many other things, several important uh, skills and techniques. One of them is the weight and balance of the aircraft, and again, before you get bored about this, this is relevant to what we're talking about later on. <clears throat> One of the things you have to do is check the total weight of the aircraft to make sure it's not above the maximum takeoff weight, but also within the center of gravity. And this envelope is the, um, the moment in envelope, which is the maximum permissible weight and maximum pers permissible position where weights can be on the aircraft. If the weight is too high, it is unsafe to operate the aircraft, simply because it's beyond the lift capability. If the weight is too far forward, it means the aircraft will be uh, longitudinally unstable and will not be unable to maintain level flight. And if the weight is too far aft, then you won't be able to maintain proper attitude and stall and crash. Why is that relevant to this story? Well, knowing that I had five passengers, six souls on board, and we're going to a picnic race, which meant we were going to have lots of food and drinks, non-alcoholic for the pilot. Um, we were going to be at maximum takeoff weight. And for this particular aircraft, six, six people on board with full baggage, you can't take full fuel. So I checked the aircraft the night before and found the tanks were full. So I took it up for some circuits and burnt off an hour of fuel, calculating that that would bring it within the safe envelope. When I returned the aircraft back to the base, I left the note in the logbook saying, do not refuel this aircraft, please leave it with partial tanks. It was clearly placarded. So I turned up early, checked the aircraft out before the passengers arrived, opened the tanks as you normally do to pre-check. Yes, somebody thought it was a good idea to fill the tanks up. So they were full, absolutely full. Needless to say, I was unhappy and expressed my dissatisfaction with the um, the aircraft rental company, and 
the person who was there was the chief flying instructor who was actually one of my instructors. And I said to him, look, I'm not taking this thing up with a full tank. Please get someone to de defuel it. And he flatly refused. He said, look, we can't do that. But here's the key message. He says, don't worry. These aircraft are designed with a tolerance. You'll be absolutely fine. You don't need to remove the fuel. Please take off and have a nice weekend. Yeah. So I did the calculation again. And that's where the weight and balance position was, well outside the envelope. So I had several choices. I could take this wise instructor's advice, who had thousands and thousands of flying hours more than I did, or we could leave one passenger behind. Uh, I don't think that would have made me too popular. Cancel the flight altogether. Maybe that's an option. Again, that wouldn't have been very popular. Or leave all the food and drinks behind, which ultimately was the decision. Uh, the, uh, the ladies who prepared all the delicious food and cakes and brought all these drinks were not happy, but I said, look, sorry, we're going to be safe. We have to leave these behind. So we took off. And believe me, we used all the runway because it was just on the, the threshold. But we took off safely. We arrived at the picnic races, had a lovely day there, extremely hungry because there were no shops. It's in the middle of nowhere. Looking forward to the return flight home. And then, you know, in the evening, we just had our picnic at the airfield. OK. Why am I sharing you this story? I'll tell you why. Exactly seven days later from this airport at Bankstown, and you can see the runway there, you may notice in the top left of the screen, there's a river. Another pilot took exactly that same aircraft for a flight. And he took off from that same runway. And he crashed in that river just up there. In Australia, they publish what they call the Aviation Safety Digest, which chronicles aviation incidents. And on this particular occasion, I'm afraid there were no survivors. This was a powerful experience and um, very unsettling episode in my flight career, and indeed in my life. And it left me with, um, I guess, a different perspective on looking at situations. And up until then, I'd been very respectful and blindly trusting of authority and those in charge. This changed that. And from that day forward, I looked at situations and thought, I have to take responsibility for myself. Do not abrogate or abdicate your safety and decisions to others. Ultimately, is yours. And that's a lesson that I've also applied in business and in life generally. So what did I use this for in the context of my first career as a radio officer? Now, there was this interesting procedure where every telegram, radio telegram that was received, we used this machine that punched a serial number on it. You can see in the illustration there. This message is number 52. There was a separate clipboard, and I know this sounds very boring, and believe me, it was boring. There's a separate clipboard, which you also get this punch, and you put in a serial number. <coughs> and you put it in, and there goes 52 on that chart. And I looked at this, and I thought, why do we do this second number? I get it for the telegram because it's a serial number. This machine only produces consecutive numbers. And they are printed on the telegram. On the night shift, you have to go through these piles of telegrams and check and make sure that they're sorted in numerical order and cross-check it with the second clipboard. So after several months of doing this procedure, I questioned and I asked all the... I was about to say old guys, but when I look back and I thought, these old guys are about my age, or younger now. But at the time, they were the old guys, the seniors. And I kept asking, why do we have the second clipboard? The only answer they could give was, we've always done it this way. And that was the only answer. I said, yeah, but it's illogical. They said, yeah, but we've always done it that way. And it was a boring task. So on one of the night shifts, I thought, hmm, I wonder what would happen if this clipboard disappeared. So I picked it up and threw it on top of a cupboard to hide it. And the next shift came in, and off I went home and had a good sleep. I went back the next day. Boy, there was a panic. No clipboard. You know, the cognitive dissonance of 
suddenly this procedure that had been used for decades and decades and decades was erased. Anyhow, after I think one or two days, the clipboard never reappeared. It was never replaced. And ultimately the station manager published a, a, a notice saying that this second board is not required. So this is my first experience with transformation and change management, something that I perfected later in my career and got paid very well for by analyzing companies and process called process mapping to see are there inefficiencies and ways of doing things better. And it relates to that flight incident where you just look at something and think if something is stupid and it shouldn't be done, you don't do it. I need to caution though that just objecting to processes or resisting uh, a way of doing things just for the sake of it is not smart. There needs to be a good reason for it. So it's the right decision at the right time for the right reasons. Anyhow, I did fess up to the station manager and said, look, I was responsible. And that could have gone two ways. It could have ended my career very quickly, but it didn't. I ended up getting promoted and I was sent um, to a town called Rockhampton in Queensland as then Australia's youngest station manager. Again, why am I sharing this with you? Well, that sign and that car is actually what's significant here. Because on the first day that I arrived, I was given the keys to the station car, company car, and went to the local service station to fill it up. So far, that's not interesting. What is interesting is this station has been there since, I think, 1928 or something. So it's been there a long while, okay? Um, I was the new guy, not the station, and certainly not that car. When I filled up the car, handed the, um, the fuel card to the station clerk, and I said to him, oh, OTC. And he says, what? What's OTC? He had never heard of the company for this landmark station that was providing primary maritime safety communications for decades. Yeah. <laughs> Throughout the war and beyond. So I said to myself, and I said to him, I said, look, before I leave here, because I was on a short tour of duty, I was there for six months, as an acting manager, I said, before I leave here, uh, I'll make sure you know what OTC is. And so it spurred me to action to seek ways of elevating the profile of OTC and the Rockhampton radio station. And the way I did this was, I just simply went out and spoke to the media outlets, got friendly with the newspaper editor and the journalists, same with the radio uh, broadcast stations and with the TV journalists as well. I organized a party at the station, food and drinks, brought all the journalists along, and they had a great time. So were buddies, first name basis. The other thing I did was I gave something back to them. Now, when we had distresses, and there were quite a few distresses every now and then, I would give them exclusive interviews on the nature of the distress, not compromising confidentiality, but just public domain information with sound bites or quotations, which is what TV and radio and newspapers like. And we had a good relationship, so the profile of Little Rockhampton Radio Station grew higher and higher. The other thing, the other initiative I took, which was to establish seminars for the local fishermen and recreational sailors. And it was a series of seminars called Radio Safety Communications, demonstrating the benefits of using marine radio as opposed to other forms of technology for maritime weather information, safety information, and distress communications. They were very successful, very popular, um, and it was really my first experience of doing public speaking, which was absolutely terrifying. For a young guy, it's terrifying for most people. I'm terrified now. Um, so, we, all of the stations, all of these radio stations around Australia were obliged to provide a, um, a quarterly media relations report. It was on the checklist of things to do, and as a station manager, that was my job. So I compiled all the newspaper articles, the log of all the radio uh, interviews and all of the TV interviews. And it was a stack about this big. Um, the report was, I think, 30 pages, uh, as well as with all the clippings. And I sent that off to headquarters. Well, my job done. When I got back to Sydney, I was summoned into headquarters by the uh, general manager. And of course, the immediate reaction is, what did I do wrong? <coughs> And the general manager says, right, we've got your report, 30 pages, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, ah, oh, maybe I'll put too much stuff in there or, you know. So I didn't know where this was going. 
And he says, look, this is your report from Rockhampton, what, this tiny little station. Here's the report from Sydney. Now, Sydney Radio was the second largest station in the Southern Hemisphere. The media relations report for Sydney was half a page. So I think I did actually get in trouble because the station man in, I made the station manager of Sydney look bad relative to Rockhampton. But anyhow, what that ended up doing was giving me opportunities because I got a profile. It wasn't my intention. My intention was to sort out that uh, service station guy. He didn't know what OTC was. But as a ping pong um, pinball game goes, you click a ball and it hits in sort of unexpected places. And that's what it did. It also created another opportunity. And OTC, the uh, telecommunications company, which was at the time um, Australia's largest international telecommunications company, sponsored a, a yacht race uh, from Hobart to Fremantle, basically one side of Australia to the other. And they were also sponsoring the radio relay vessel, which was a specially equipped ship to support the fleet traveling from one side of Australia to the other. And to support this, uh, this voyage, um, they needed a radio, radio vessel, radio relay vessel, with a chief radio officer and a regular radio officer. So I put my name in the hat. I was fairly young, fairly inexperienced relative to a lot of the other applicants who were considerably older and far, far more experienced than I. Let's see what happens. Anyhow, the, it was a bit like graduation day. All the names were on the board. Everyone was crowded around. I went up there to see, you know, maybe if I could be a radio officer on this thing, it would be great. Because the radio officers only do one leg. I was uh, appointed chief radio officer, so I was there for the entire duration and responsible for all the communications on the vessel and the supervision and management of the radio officers as a kid. Okay, I was up for the challenge. This is a four and a half thousand kilometer voyage from Hobart to Fremantle, Perth, um, escorting over a hundred yachts on this um, classic ocean race. This is the vessel, the radio relay vessel, which was a converted uh, fishing trawler, and it was equipped with pretty much every form of communication available at the time, including Morse code. We had VHF, HF, MF, radio, and satellite communications. In those days, having satellite communications on a vessel of this size, this is a 33 meter trawler, was exceptional. You know, because the satellite communications terminals in those days were a one meter parabolic dish on a gyroscopically stabilized platform housed in a typically fiberglass radar on a pedestal. Usually that would be on vessels of hundreds of thousands of tons, not a 33 meter fishing boat. So we escorted the fleet, the cannons went off, and there's the captain with the glasses there in charge of the Marine de Pearl, and off we went to escort the fleet. And our role was twofold. One was to relay the communications from the short range, low powered radios of the race fleet from us to headquarters so they could plot their positions provide weather information and safety information to all of the captains of these yachts, and also to provide on-scene support in case of any emergencies. There was another role, which was to provide publicity for the event, and we had a journalist on board, which I'll come back to in a second. We were given special training to use all of this equipment, even though we were experienced radio officers, the uh, SATCOM terminals uh, in this case, it was an Immarsat A, and there's two models there. The one on the right, um, yes, the one on the right uh, was actually the one that was fitted on the Marinda Pearl, the relay vessel. And you can see the handsome young man there with moustache and hair. God, where did that go? Um, that terminal that I'm leaning on is actually the what they call the below decks equipment for the SACOM system. I mean, it's huge compared to what's available today. Uh, and we had to know how to orient the antenna to the satellite, be able to find it, as well as a few other tasks. So that's fine. We knew how to use all the toys, and off we went. I mentioned the journalist. Um, the gentleman up there was our onboard radio journalist. He was quite a famous radio journalist at the time. And his role was to 
interview the captains and the crew of these yachts, provide interesting stories for this three and a half week classic ocean race. It was unprecedented at the time. And my role, as well as my radio officer's role, was to make sure that the communications were stable and that he could make his um, flawless interviews with the radio stations around Australia via satellite. And then we had problems. The satellite kept dropping out. And it kept dropping out, and it kept dropping out. Now, this is my first experience of using SATCOM on a ship. We used the shore equivalent, but not on a ship. And so I was communicating with HF radio to shore, talking to the engineers, trying to do diagnostics. Anyway, it was a long, long, painful process. Very unpopular with the journalist who had a very short fuse, by the way. Um, and there's this kid trying to figure this out. So in the end, I pulled the radar off and had a look at this gyroscopically stabilized platform. There was some corrosion on the gyroscopic gimbal. I managed to clean that off and lubricate it. It improved the stability quite a bit. And what I did prior to each interview was make sure that I was manually controlling this automatically steered parabolic dish antenna. And for the rest of the voyage, it worked fine. And for a little while, I was a hero for fixing that particular problem. But there was another problem. And um, we were just on the fringe of AM broadcast radio reception. And the, uh, and the, and the, uh, the crew wanted to hear the football. So they were um, missing this because the broadcast receiver wasn't working because the antenna was corroded. So I decided to fix this and went up on top of the deck, on top of the uh, bridge, removed the antenna, took it downstairs, dismantled it. There was a brilliant workshop down below, managed to fix it and then put it back on, reassembled it. And meanwhile, it was cocktail hour on the boat. The captain and the crew were down below having fun, enjoying the football, having beers, while I was just doing the last few adjustments up on the deck. We were in the middle of the Great Australian Bight. Um, if you remember that shape of Australia, that large open expanse of water, that's called the Great Australian Bight. Um, and it's close to nowhere. You know, if you go south, the next thing you hit is Antarctica. So I'm on the top of the superstructure here, and the boat had this nice regular swell. And I was pretty good on my feet balancing on this. A rogue wave hit the boat, or the ship, and instead of rolling this way as I expected it to, it rolled the other way, but I was leaning in the same direction. So off the top of the bridge I went, and I was heading straight for the Southern Ocean. So I just threw out one of my arms and managed to just grab a guy wire and was just hanging on that with my feet dangling over the edge of the boat and just hanging there. Managed to get back on board, went downstairs, didn't say anything and had a beer. And then I reflected on it. And I'll pause there and come back to it a little later. During the trip, we did actually get involved with a search and rescue. It wasn't a big search and rescue because, and it wasn't involving any of the, uh, the yachts. It was a fellow fisherman who had his net tangled in the propeller of his trawler. So we tied up alongside and assisted him, but while we were doing this, we also recovered a lot of the fish that were floating out there, and so we had fresh fish for a couple of days. And we managed to tow him safely and eventually untangled his nets. Now, the captain was quite a cool guy, and the crew were also equally cool, and we were up to doing things to entertain the... Uh, the passengers as well. So we were effectively um, skiing behind a 33 meter uh, fishing trawler on a piece of wood with a bit of rope. That was it. It was just a homemade contraption. And we all had to go, including me, of course. Uh, so I'm hanging on to this thing. I've never done this before in my life. And of course, within 30 seconds, I was in the water. Climbed back on board the, uh, the plank, which is all it was and sat there. And the Marinda Pearl just kept going and kept going and got smaller and smaller and smaller. And at the time it felt like it was going into the horizon and eventually turned around. Even to this day, I never know whether that was just the normal turning circle of a vessel of that size or whether the captain was having a bit of fun at my expense. But anyway, it just got me thinking, it's a big ocean out here <laughs> and I'm really tiny. And I also reflected on the fact that a day before, two days before, I would have been there without a 
a board and without anyone noticing, because that's the thing that I didn't mention was nobody below was aware that I was on the deck. So I had gone into the water and it was getting towards sunset. I don't believe I would have been recovered, maybe. Anyhow, it was a lesson. Let's move on to aeronautical satellite communications. So now we're actually onto the topic. And before satellites became available in the 1990s at this stage, when you were flying over remote areas, whether it's deserts or oceans, the only way pilots could communicate with the outside world was via high frequency radio, HF radio, shortwave radio. <coughs> Initially, it was actually via Morse code, um, but that was abandoned in the early 60s. So it was all radio telephony on HF. <coughs> so I, uh, I was involved at that stage in um, promoting Australia's mobile satellite services. We, in fact, I was in charge of launching Australia's first mobile satellite service um, that covered two thirds of the um, Earth's surface, Pacific and Indian Ocean region. Um, as a result of all these endeavors that I've undertaken, I was given this enormous opportunity and responsibility. So promoting this service and marketing it really was my um, uh, key uh, responsibility. And I thought one of the ways I could do this was to promote one of the new services, which was in Mars at Sea. Now in Mars at Sea, and I'll show you what one of these terminals looks like, is 45 centimeter flower pot, we used to call it, with a quadrihelix, quadrophyla helix antenna. It was transmitting data, store and forward data, at a blistering speed of 600 bits per second way faster than Morse code. So this was really a huge advance in technology that you could communicate almost anywhere on the planet with store and forward messaging, text messaging, and position reporting, primarily designed for ships at sea, uh, but also could be used for land. And I thought, well, why not use it on an aircraft? So I took the initiative to bolt one of these things in the back of an aircraft, strap it to a battery, and point the antenna through the rear windscreen. Took some friends along with me and said, right, let's go to Thursday Island, which is a tiny little island on the tip of uh, Queensland. It's the furthest, almost northerly part of Australia. Uh, it's about 3,000 kilometers. And I had this Inmarsat Sea terminal in the back of the aircraft, periodically sending position reports. I know none of you are excited by this now, but in the 1990s, this was um, a world first. In fact, this was the very first demonstration of satellite communications in a general aviation light aircraft. And of course, I exploited that opportunity and, and made sure we got lots of publicity for it. <coughs> and it did prove that it worked, that you could monitor the progress of an aircraft using satellite. Today, over oceanic regions, special aeronautical satellite communication solutions to do exactly this thing. And the uh, MH370 um, disaster that happened several years ago, it's because of that position reporting system that they were able to track the approximate location of where that uh, aircraft crashed. Regrettably, not close enough because it's still messy. There were other opportunities for demonstrating the company's telecommunication services and aeronautical communication services. And one of them was in 1988, the Round Australia Bicentennial Air Race. This was an 11,000 kilometer race around the entire country. And it was expensive, more expensive than I could afford, even sharing it with my friends. So I made a deal with the company that I worked for and I said, look, if you sponsor me, I'll get publicity for you. I'll do radio interviews in flight, have the logo on the aircraft. How about it? Anyway, I had a reputation that I earned in uh, Rockhampton many years earlier. And so I got a nice big fat check. And the eight of us, seven friends and myself, hired uh, an aircraft, uh, a Cessna 411, and we participated in this race. It's been called the greatest aviation spectacle in history, the Great Bicentennial Air Race. More than 100 aeroplanes from around Australia and around the world 
circumnavigating this massive island continent. And the aircraft swooped through to Woomera in Queensland, on through the vast outback, through the Northern Territory, down the west coast of Australia, and they're now making their way to Race End in Canberra next Saturday. By the way, I only discovered this video yesterday. I was looking for a picture. I thought, oh, is there any historical records of this? Because, you know, this is pre-internet era. I was amazed that this thing existed. So the aircraft we, uh, we chartered was, um, as I said, a Cessna 411. Uh, a nice, fast, comfortable, 340 horsepower, twin turbocharged uh, light aircraft, cruising at about 350 kilometers an hour. And it was quite comfortable for the, uh, the passengers as well. And I'd say that this is probably a lot better than flying on uh, some of the budget airlines that you fly in today. And it was a lot cheaper too. So we got the publicity, um, we got the headlines in the newspapers, radio interviews, and I can tell you, it was tiring. This was a grueling, grueling experience. Probably the most tired I'd ever been in, in flying operations. Um, we had pre-dawn briefings, uh, and I somehow developed the worst flu ever. So at one stage, I couldn't talk, so I got my friend who was um, the co-pilot, although he wasn't a pilot, he was just the guy sitting in the uh, co-pilot seat, uh, to do some of the interviews for me. Anyhow, we had a lot of fun. It was a great experience. And it elevated the, the, um, the visibility of aeronautical communications. Albeit on this aircraft, it was radio, but it just demonstrated that telephony could be done in aircraft, and the next step, or the next logical step, was satellite. So that gave me the opportunity to become part of a quadripartite consortium called Satellite Aircom, which was composed of the telecommunications operator of Australia and Canada and France, together with the airline-owned telecommunications company called CETA. And I was appointed as their uh, marketing director, as well as on the board of, um, on the, on the, as a non-executive director on the board. And it gave me opportunities to speak to conferences. One of the early conferences I spoke at was in uh, Singapore, where I had uh, an audience, I think it was over a thousand. In fact, there were two rooms. There was the primary room and then a secondary room that was televised. And that was quite intimidating at the time. Full of airline executives trying to convince them that they should spend millions and millions of dollars to install satellite communications equipment on their beautiful jets that would reduce the payload and slow the aircraft down because it would add drag to the antennas and the extra mass of the antennas and the equipment below. Today it's commonplace, but in those days it was quite a push. S at the same time, I was also given the honour of being appointed a non-executive director on the board of Inmarsat, this global mobile satellite communications company that was the first and at the time the largest satellite communications company for mobile services. That was an amazing learning experience. Uh, even though I, I was studying my master's degree in business at the time, believe me, the real lessons in business I learned from that board. But it also involved a lot of travel, which at the time was fun. When you're young and single, today I'm not so excited by international travel. Uh, I'm very well worn of that novelty. But in those days, every time, and by the way, I was going to Europe and the UK at least six or seven times a year as part of my duties, I would always make uh, an effort to go and visit the crew in the flight deck. As an aviator and also being interested, this was fun. This is pre-9-11 days, so it was perfectly fine to go into the flight deck and talk to the, uh, the flight crew. The other reason for talking to these guys was just to find out how were they finding the satellite communication system? Because Qantas was an early pioneer company that was using the satellite technology for um, position reporting and communications via a system called ACARS, Aircraft Communications and Reporting System. Now, ACARS has been around for many, many years uh, via VHF line of sight radio. This was adapted to work via satellite. Now you can see the red arrow there pointing to a green screen and a keyboard there. That's the ACARS terminal, which primarily works with VHF, but in this Qantas aircraft was also working via satellite. 
And it was a revolution in aviation at the time that the crew could receive weather reports, notices to airmen could inform the operations base of any operational anomalies that require maintenance in advance so that parts and crew would be ready when they arrived to ensure the quick turnaround of the aircraft. It was a big financial operational gain for the airlines. <clears throat> and satellite communications was making that possible. So on one particular flight, I rocked up into the flight deck, told them who I was, that I had wings as well, and blah, blah, blah. I said, how hey, are you enjoying this satellite communications terminal? And I won't repeat the Australian vernacular um, of what they actually said, but uh, they basically said, doesn't work, mate. I was speechless. Here I was, well, expecting the usual compliments and how wonderful it was. These guys were telling me, no, your system doesn't work. Okay. These flights are about 22 hours, typically. So when I got back into Sydney, 5.30 in the morning, hit the sack. Actually, no, before I hit the sack, I sent a, a message to the operations centre in Perth saying, what's going on? I think it was a bit coarser than that, but what's going on will be good enough for this conference or this meeting. The next day, I called the operations centre. I said, look, can you please check the system? I've just come off a flight from London to Sydney, and on the Singapore to Sydney leg, flight crew telling me the SATCOM system is down. So they checked, and they checked, and they checked. They said, yep, the data system is working, the amplifiers are working, the radio systems are working, everything is working. I said, okay, check it again. And they checked it and checked it. Anyway, when I went into the office, I spoke to the chief engineer, who was a good friend of mine, and I said, this is more than embarrassing. We're trying to encourage airlines to adopt this technology. And in parallel with this, there was, um, there was a campaign called, or an initiative, I should call it, called FANS, the Future Air Navigation System, under the auspices of the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, which governs all airline operations around the world. And I've been to a few of these ICAO meetings uh, as part of the delegation to encourage ICAO to adopt satellite communications for in-flight telephony, in-flight communications, not just for passengers, but also for crew, for routine communications and safety communications. Now, the airline industry and the aviation industry in general is very particular about safety. In fact, the standards that we had to adhere to is what they call four nines, nine, 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 nine levels of availability. <clears throat> Having just got off a flight, where the system doesn't work, didn't really help that campaign. Anyway, cutting a long story short, yes, the engineers did check the subsystems and every subsystem worked, except the final mile. Some bright technician decided that when they were doing tests to connect the antenna of the power amplifier into a dummy load. Any radio engineers in the room? Okay, so a dummy load is, is basically a device that absorbs radio energy when you're doing tests. It doesn't radiate the radio energy. So it was connected to basically a hole in the ground and it wasn't being radiated. So even though the subsystems worked, it wasn't going into space. It wasn't reaching the satellite. So from that point on, I insisted that when tests are done, I want end-to-end -end testing from satellite terminal to space to another satellite terminal. That is the only valid proof, end-to-end -end testing. And again, that's a lesson in life that applies to a lot of things. Next challenge that I was given was to embark on a business evaluation of the then new low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit satellite communication services. Now today everyone's talking about Starlink and all of these mega cost constellations that are coming out that all of these rich um, billionaires are investing in and developing. Okay. Um, it's nothing new. In the 1990s, exactly the same thing happened. And there were several companies at the time. This is not the full list, by the way. It was double this. But at the time, Global Star, Ellipso, Odyssey, and Iridium, and I think some of you would recognize Iridium, yeah, um, were part of the front runners. <coughs> My job 
on behalf of the company was to, to do a due diligence on all of these systems to see if it was worthwhile investing. So I was sent packing and traveling around the world to go and inspect these systems at each company and to do the business analysis and the cost analysis for each of these systems. And uh, it was quite a tough journey because, of course, every company would, would sell this thing and, and praise its amazing capabilities. <laughs> Interestingly, all but, there is only two of these that exist today, which is Iridium and Global Star. Both of them went Chapter 11, that is bankrupt. And they were ultimately rescued because they did not support the business case. And interestingly enough, Global Star, <coughs> late last year, demonstrated the first communications from a regular mobile phone, an iPhone 14, direct to satellite. So it's available today um, without special equipment. It's just a normal mobile phone. It's only for short messages and emergency messages, and it's only available in the USA and Canada, but eventually will be rolled out around the world. This was the original concept back in the 1990s, so it's not new. And all of these systems were competing with different satellite configurations. Now, I like to give the Iridium anecdote. The Iridium constellation consists, at least the original plan, was for 66 satellites. And the reason why they picked the name Iridium is because those of you are physicists here will recall that the atomic element Iridium has an atomic number of 66. And so the original constellation was 66 polar orbiting satellites to provide full planetary coverage. Sadly, the business case was starting to look thinner and thinner, and so the engineers quickly scrambled to strip down the constellation. And so instead of 66, uh, they reduced the satellite numbers down to, I think it was 55, I can't remember exactly the number, but I do remember what the atomic element was for that, if there's any physicists here can help me, and the atomic element was dysprosium. Dysprosium comes from a, the Greek word, which can be roughly translated into try harder. Anyway, at the time, Iridium were um, putting a huge campaign on my company, which at the time had just merged with the domestic operator. So there were interesting power plays going on. So this is my first exposure to serious office politics, another learning experience. And this telecom, in terms of size, OTC was around about two, two and a half thousand employees. Uh, telecom had about 70,000. So it was a village versus a city in terms of the population difference. And they called it a merger. When you've got a big company and a little company, that ain't a merger. Okay, that's a takeover. And they wanted to run their own due diligence. So the exercise that I performed 12 months earlier had to be repeated again, but this time with telecom people who knew nothing about satellites, but it doesn't matter, they were telecom. So off we went. Had the usual talks again from the same companies, produced the same report. But uh, I was tasked to produce an independent report. And I wrote, for the first time and the only time, a business case not to invest. In other words, a negative business case. So the other team were presenting their business case to invest 20 million. My business case was saying not to invest 20 million. And these are the reasons why. And it was, a it was a tight call, a really tight call, because there was a, um, a, a FOMO, fear of missing out, hysteria, building in the board, saying, oh, if we don't invest, we'll miss out, you know, we'll pay more, we'll this, we'll that. I said, look, the business case does not add up. You put your money in there, you'll never see it again. 18 months later, Iridium went chapter 11 and busted. And all those who put their 20 million, their 50 million, their 100 million, lost it, except us. At the time, Inmarsat was creating its own handheld satellite initiative. This is in the early 90s, before Iridium, well before Iridium. And this is an interesting case study. Not many people know about it, at least unless you're involved in this. Initially, it was called Inmarsat Project 21. 
and it was looking at the evolution of the global mobile personal communication services. This is in the days when there was just uh, first generation, second generation mobile phones. Not even feature phones, just plain old telephone mobile phones with text messaging and big clunky phones of that too. And then as the concept matured and the analysis became richer, it was then rebranded as Inmarsat P, P for personal, because the Inmarsat portfolio of products had a letter subscript. It started off with Inmarsat A, I mentioned the Inmarsat C system, Inmarsat P was in the evolution. And Inmarsat P fundamentally was going to be a handheld satellite telephone. When I say handheld, I'm talking about something probably this big, um, like the original bricks. <coughs> now, I need to talk about the, the board of Inmarsat and its structure. And it's an interesting case study. It consisted of 22 investors, country investors, or nation investors, of which Australia was one of them, one of the founding investors. And the voting rights were proportional to the financial investment in the organisation. It was an intergovernmental organisation, not for profit, but operating profitably, if that makes sense. And it was operating under a UN charter and had peaceful purposes obligations and had reporting to a UN um, organisation called the International Maritime Organisation, which was actually the, the parent of the organisation to start with. And, this is, and it was born in 1979 to provide initially maritime satellite communications and eventually grew into land mobile and aeronautical. So this Project 21, which morphed into Inmarsat P, required a huge investment, billions, billions of dollars of investment. And under the existing model at the time of Inmarsat, the investment in the system was proportional to your shareholding. The biggest shareholder was the United States with just less than 25%. And then it was the UK, um, Germany, France, Russia, and then all the others. <laughs> Australia initially had 1.6% investment, tiny. But we disproportionately asserted a greater uh, influence on the board of MRSAT than our shareholding. Maybe it's because of the language, maybe it's because of the founding, or maybe it's because of the effort I put into it, but we were seen as the go-to um, country by the management of Inmarsat to push through difficult decisions on the board. And this was an extremely difficult decision and an extremely difficult debate. And I was part of that decision-making team. And the objections put forward by the big investors were, was, is there a market? This is too much to invest, and they didn't want to pursue it. So the decision just kept getting deferred, and deferred, and deferred. And it just went on and on and on. Remember, this was the first initiative. This is preceding Iridium, preceding any other satellite operator. It was the first concept for a handheld satellite telep telephony. Eventually, Iridium came on the scene. And eventually, Iridium launched some satellites and sought investment. So while the race was going on and Inmarsat was still trying to figure out could it get investment, and eventually it, it, it was unable to resolve it, so it created a spin-off company called ICO, ICO, to establish this handheld service. And I'll get to, this, to the end of this quite soon. So Inmarsat stayed delivering its geostationary services. Inmarsat uh, ICO, which was open to new investment from the existing members or other external investors, just to operate handheld satellite services. Sadly, ICO 2 went chapter 11 and went bankrupt. So pre-20th century, there were no real survivors on their own merit of these new constellations, mega investment handheld satellite systems, which could be an interesting harbinger for maybe some of these new mega constellations that are about to be launched. And there is a good reason for it, because even back in the 90s, you know, there was a lot of cellular coverage. So why would you use an expensive satellite system when your phone works? And in remote areas, there are not a lot of people there. So is there enough market, population of market, 
to pay the billions for that huge constellation. And that's fundamentally where the business case failed. So, and this is just a, hand, uh, a sample of the handsets. None of these actually got off the ground. Um, Iridium was rescued by the United States Department of Defense through a long-term contract that allowed them to continue to operate the service and with these big contracts for the US uh, DOD, they are still flying today and have a global presence. And as I said, Global Star is still operating. So my exposure to this way of working with this um, politically driven, financially driven organization called Inmarsat really presented a number of challenges. We had what is called a fiduciary duty. In other words, a duty to act in the interests, or the best interests, of the organization that we were uh, responsible for, Inmarsat. And the brief that I had from Australia was three things. Primary objective was fiduciary responsibility for Inmarsat. Secondary responsibility was economic interests of OTC, the company that I worked for. And the third one was the interest of Australia, in that order. And that seemed sound and right from a business point of view, sound and right from a legal point of view, sound and right from an ethical point of view. And I was quite content to do that. That wasn't always the case with all the countries and all the investors, as I discovered. <laughs> And that's the original Imarsat headquarters at the time. One of the roles that I was given while I was on the board of Imarsat, and again, I was quite a young guy, um, I was elected and appointed as chairman of the future uh, satellite planning committee, where we had to estimate the demand for future satellite services for Inmarsat. And it was really a, I guess, a coordination role. At least that's how I took it, because the actual crunching of the modeling and the numbers were done by the really bright guys in Inmarsat. And Inmarsat recruited the brightest and the best from around the world. It's probably the most international organization I've ever worked at. Every nation you can imagine was there. You know, the best PhDs, masters, you name it, the best of the best were working there. And it paid very well, which is not, not one of the reasons why it had the best. And some really clever guys were doing the modeling for the forecasting of all these services, aeronautical, maritime, land, mobile. Okay, so far so good. So I get this new chairmanship role, I'm sitting at the board, and around the table we have the the clever people who are doing the actual modeling, and then we have the representatives of all the countries. The same issue surfaced. The big investors, or the big shareholders, I should say, were concerned about the big investment in terms of the sizing of the next generation satellite. The bigger the satellite, the bigger the investment, the more cash they have to put out, which wasn't on their brief. So despite the precision of the forecasting, there were adjustments adjustments to the forecasts. So we spent more time doing what I would call political manipulation of the gradient of these forecasts rather than scientific analysis of saying, right, there are so many hundred thousand vessels in the world of which these are super tankers, these are passenger ships, these are trawlers, these are pleasure craft, so many trucks, buses, trains, so many airliners, light aircraft, jets, and then work out a percentage of penetration, percentage of utilization, percentage of adoption, and very clever algorithms that cranked out how many minutes or bits of data each of these customer segments would generate, your classic forecasting modeling. And then there were those who were trying to push it down, push it down, just reduce it, reduce it, reduce it. Anyhow, by the time we finished producing the model, it didn't resemble at all the original forecast model that the very clever people designed. But it was politically acceptable and the board signed it off and then the tenders were issued to the satellite manufacturers to build this huge satellite the size of a double-decker bus and build three of them, in fact four, uh, to have a global constellation. And off we went. And then we turned the lights on and then started selling the services. 
Now pay attention to this graph. So you can see it's dominated by C, which makes sense because in my set originally was a maritime satellite communications organization. But at the time, the board and the company were convinced that everybody wants to make phone calls while they're on an airplane. Why wouldn't you? It's boring, you're stuck there for hours. You want to ring up mum and the kids and say, hey, I'm sitting on this airplane on board. What do you know? Some people do that today, but anyway. And land, we thought, well, there's a lot of mobile phone out there, not many people are going to use land communications. Forecast, then the actuals. Did you spot the difference? So basically, air and land swapped. Now, this is a illustrative graph, it's not actual numbers. But from memory, and this is going back quite a few decades, that's more or less the gradient. And that's more or less the shift. So in case you missed it, that's the difference. And it took everybody by surprise because we were so certain that with all the scientific process, despite the manipulation, that we couldn't have got it so wrong. Happily, the, the flip was almost balanced. So what we lost on air, we gained on land. So the revenue forecasts were the same. It was just the type of traffic that differed. On reflection, it actually makes sense. Because if you're on an airliner, are you really going to go and call your, your family and friends? Or if you're a businessman, are you really going to talk to your business colleague and say, yes, my competition's doing this and I need to invest in that and reveal commercially confidential information to the three people in front of you, the two people on the side, the three at the back, the flight attendants and everyone else. The other reason why you won't be doing this is you probably want to be asleep. So for these long transoceanic long, long flights, either you're asleep on the aeroplane or the people on the other side of the world are asleep. So there's really no um, harmonization of the diurnal time frame to really make this thing viable. As it's turned out, the big usage for satellite communications is data, as indeed mobile phones today. Uh, especially the younger generation, do you actually make phone calls on mobile phones? Don't think so. It's, it's data, it's all data. And that was an interesting learning experience. The other thing that shifted it was the type of users. Around about this time, there were two wars in the Gulf. Some of you may have heard of them. <laughs> and what they did, it generated a lot of traffic. News gathering agencies were all over the place, um, collecting information, interviews, and some of the uh, military forces were using these services for their communications. And after the wars, these satellite services were being used to rebuild the infrastructure that was damaged by the war. So there was a lot of traffic on land, not much in the air. Interesting experience. Another phase of my career was when I was ultimately headhunted by Inmarsat. I think they got fed up with me telling them what to do on the board, so they gave me a position in management, and I was responsible for the global business development of, of Inmarsat in seven regions, which covered about 160 countries. And the first thing I did when I arrived in London at the, the relatively new Inmarsat headquarters, and I asked the Director General, who used to be my boss in Australia, I actually helped him get his role in, in Inmarsat, I asked him, I said, Warren, what would I need to do to impress you within the first six months of my new job. And he said to me, Don, we've been trying to penetrate India for years. Get me a deal in India for land mobile satellite communications. I had no idea what that involved, uh, but the cocky young thing that I was, I said, yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, I'll take it, boss. Leave it with me. All right. So I studied what was needed, and I thought, well, I need to get down to India. So first flight, off to India and start doing some uh, discovery. And one of the things that we did was we had our regional office down in uh, New Delhi and a great regional representative. This guy opened doors. Um, I had two meetings with the Minister of Communications in India, as well as a meeting with the Minister of Defence in their residences. 
that might sound awfully grandiose, but it was pretty standard for doing business in, in, in those days when you were from a big organisation such as Inmarsat. The big objection the government of India had to use of satellite communications was their fear that satellite communications would be used by terrorists for nefarious purposes. And so by banning it and preventing the use of it, it would keep India safe. The campaign that I and Inmarsat presented to them was, look, people who want to do belligerent activities will get the system anyway. They can smuggle it, they can buy it, they can bring it in through Pakistan anywhere. Yeah, it's not a hard thing to, to bring in. Um, by having regulations that prevent the use of it, all you're doing is harming your own people by limiting their ability to communicate amongst themselves and with the outside world. And, you know, there's a huge poor population that have access to no communications. None at all. And this was going to be their lifeline. And so we managed to persuade the Minister of Communications that this was a good idea and other stakeholders, but it was the Minister of Defence who just said, no, security, not on my watch. Anyhow, the clock is ticking, six months went by. I thought, okay, we need to work on this. So I collaborated with our regional representative and a photojournalist. And we had a number of pilot projects around the world. And we had a pilot project in a tiny little village on the Ganges River in the uh, centre of India, more or less the centre of India, called Hitmapur. And it's close to nothing. Close to nothing. And what we had was a little demonstration satellite terminal there providing this community with 20th century communications in the 20th century. So what I did was, okay, flew from London to Delhi, then flew for just over an hour from New Delhi to the nearest airport at Lucknow. And then from Lucknow, it was, um, if I remember, about a two hour ride, cab ride, to the end of the road. In other words, when the road stopped, there was no more road, and get out and hike in the bush. And that was a couple of hours in the, in the bush. Just bush, track. And hiking in the bush until there was no more track. We came to the river. Now, I was warned in advance that there was supposed to be a punt, a little tiny boat that was supposed to help us get across the, the river because the bridge wasn't built and it was just open water. Uh, and if the boat doesn't turn up, because most things over there were unreliable, and I think they still are, we might have to swim across the river. Yeah, fine. Now, my colleagues back in the UK thought this was a, you know, a horrible imposition didn't realise this is what I do in Australia for fun. I love hiking in bush and bush. Swimming across rivers is what I do for a pastime. So when I was warned that, you know, horror, I might have to swim across the river, I thought, OK, bring it on. And when the punt didn't arrive, I thought, oh, this is good, because it was really hot too. And it was quite nice to have a refreshing swim. So I had my swimming costume with me, and sure enough, we had to swim across the river. And holding the satellite terminal above our head and clothing to keep it all dry so we could get to the other side. We had to do this twice because the second punt didn't turn up either. So we finally arrived at the village, or at least at the uh, perimeter of the village. And my chauffeur was waiting for me on a motorcycle. Now, uh, I've been riding motorcycles for quite a few years. I don't think I've ever sat on the back of a bike. And I wasn't going to sit on the back of a motorcycle for this time. So I said, no, mate, you're on the back. And uh, so I rode into the village uh, to greet the, the town man. And remember, this is a tiny village, 300 people. There's no road, no fresh water, no electricity, no telecommunications, no connection to the outside world. Basically, what is there is what they eat and live with. So they've got, cow they've got cows, they grow crops, they get fish. That's it. And chickens. And that's how they sustain themselves. Almost a Stone Age existence. The town mayor was also the town priest and the town medic. The hospital was a table not much bigger than that, under a bamboo shelter, open air. So if you got sick, you were thrown on that slab and 
the medic priest mayor did whatever he had to do. How he did it, I don't know. And so we installed this satellite communications terminal there, phased array um, satellite panel, with a solar panel there to provide power for charging the batteries. And the guy on the left-hand side is the town mayor, priest, and medic. <coughs> the other guys were his colleagues. And that's on the roof of the, uh, the temple slash town mayor's residence. And it was a hit. Photojournalists took lots of cool photos, which eventually got publicized in uh, all of the Indian newspapers. And, um, you know, it was a big event. I mean, the locals were delighted. This guy could hardly contain his excitement at being able to use satellite communications for the first time. And so we um, established this system. You can see that there are um, just a bunch of 12 volt batteries powering this thing. So it was as basic as it gets. Uh, but it worked. It really worked. Um, it not only worked technically, it also created quite a swell and quite a stir in the uh, government of India. Cutting a long story short, it ultimately resulted in a change of legislation. And the government of India finally agreed to allow the personal use of satellite communications for Indian citizens. As a result of that, um, more than a thousand of these, what they call PCOs, public call offices, were established around rural communities throughout India. And it transformed the country. There's one little anecdote I almost overlooked, and I need to share this with you. So far I'm talking about executive traveling the world, making business, and by the way, this was the biggest sale of MISAT terminals in history at the time. It was, um, I think, $20 million at the time, which was huge for MISAT. On our journey back, some guy out of the bush just intercepted us. And we're talking to the, um, the guide and the photojournalist and yak, 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 yak. And anyway, after a few minutes of talking, and I'm just standing there thinking, guy comes out of the bush, has a chat. Yeah, why not? Then the guide came up to me and says, look, um, this gentleman has come from a village two days away, and he's got another day's walk before he gets to the next village where there's a telephone. And he needs to get hold of a telephone because his brother-in-law's wife is dying. And he wants to call him to tell him to come and pay his last respects. Would you mind if you could use our SATCOM terminal? There's only one answer for that, of course. We didn't get PR for that. I didn't want to. But it was probably one of the most worthwhile experiences in my career at the time where we were just helping somebody and you know the things that we take for granted access to fresh clean water roads transport communications isn't available to everybody on the planet but we made a difference in this occasion and these public call offices via the MRSAT large antenna M, as it was called at the time were in use until only a few years ago so it had a long long legacy on the other side of the coin, military use of satellite communications. I was at a conference earlier this week um, explaining the issues associated with the use of civil satellites for military operations. It's quite a complex challenge. I had the, um, the opportunity of two, two tours of duty at the UK Ministry of Defence for two different generations of military satellite. The Skynet 5 system and more recently, the Skynet 6 system. And each of those missions were quite different. The Skynet 5 mission was essentially a transformation program. Remember that clipboard? Some of those skills, wouldn't say I exactly used in this, uh, in this gig, but um, it really was to identify cost savings for the Ministry of Defense. They were bleeding waste, like you wouldn't believe, and they were totally stressed being unable to afford their programs. So at the time I was part of what was then Europe's largest consultancy project. We had uh, about 120 consultants crawling all over the MOD looking at opportunities for savings. I was in charge of the satellite 
sector. So there were other guys looking at rifles, ships, guns, bullets, bombs, planes, you name it. My job was satellite. And I was on my own because there was no one else that had that background. And it was really, really interesting. And there were a number of challenges that uh, I was given and I had to solve. And it covered the maritime requirements, aeronautical and land mobile users. <coughs> I also had the opportunity of going on top on, uh, to inspect some of these really cool platforms. This is a T-45 destroyer. And um, actually I went on it with my family to have a look inside. And what is interesting is there's a, there's a characteristic called size, weight and power, which has to do with the physical parameters of a satellite system. Now you would think that a vessel like this, 150 meters long, um, 8,000 tons, you wouldn't have issues with size, weight and power. Look at the superstructure there and that big ray dome on the top. If you have too much mass at that height above the waterline, that affects the center of gravity. Even of a vessel of this size in heavy weather, that could affect its safety and stability. So you can't have too much mass. Size has an impact as well. You couldn't say this thing is stealthy, but they've designed it in such a way to minimize its radar footprint from interrogation from enemy radar. So the smaller the objects are on the superstructure, the better. And then the dimension of power, you would think, well, this thing's got huge gas turbine engines. Surely there's plenty of power. Yes, there's plenty of power, but all that power is being used. Not only is that power being used, it's being used inefficiently. And the byproduct of that is heat, which requires ventilation or cooling. So size, weight and power, and byproducts, heat, need to be taken into account above decks, also below decks, in the electronic warfare room. It was packed. It was designed with all of the weapon systems or electronic warfare systems, but new things get invented. And so they had to build additional pedestals in every square meter they could find to accommodate this extra technology. So size, weight and power affects even a huge platform like this. And it was on my agenda to check all this equipment out. This is an earlier destroyer, the T-42. And I had the privilege of actually going on sea trials where they're actually doing war games on this vessel. The context of all of this is um, we were really looking at ways of identifying cost-saving opportunities. On my second tour of duty was to look at the user requirements for the military across all three domains, air, sea and land, and all as aspects of operations. <coughs> And it was quite a challenging task because every domain, you know, the Army or the Navy or the Air Force, considered themselves more important than the others. And so they wanted to dominate the access to the asset. They wanted to have the maximum budget, which is pretty typical. That's human nature. And we had to elicit user requirements to make sure that they were precisely aligned as best as you can, given the anomalies that can happen with forecasting, which I'd experienced earlier uh, within Marsat so that we dimension the spacecraft right, so that it's not overly dimensioned, but not too small so there's not enough capacity. The other aspect is the user terminals. Make sure that fit for purpose terminals were available for ground forces, maritime users, and the aeronautical platforms. And even the aeronautical platforms, there's a big difference between an MRTT, A330 uh, multi-role tanker transport, which is 230,000 kilos, versus a fighter jet, or a strike aircraft, or a drone. So each application, each what they call CONOPS, or concept of operations or use case, needs to be taken into account when designing these user requirements. There's another facet of communications which not a lot of people know about, and that is today, deployed troops expect access to communications when they're um, in remote areas. It's called welfare communications. Basically, it's access to telephony, messaging, sometimes video conferencing. And it is quite a significant cost for the troops. The contractor at the time was reviewing the costs of these services. And they were suggesting to the management of the MOD that they will increase the charges that they apply 
for these services over time. Um, now, I should point out this graph is a conceptual graph, but the gradients are more or less what was done. Um, I don't have the original data, and even if I did, I wouldn't show it. However, um, and also the, the epoch, the elapsed epoch is correct. The intersection point is made up deliberately um, to obfuscate a few things. So, the contractor was saying, costs are gonna go up, we're gonna charge you more. And this was for Imarsat services. And so the management of, of the MOD asked me, Don, could you help us? The big bad supplier wants to rip us off with these increased charges. Do you know anything about Imarsat? Yeah, I know a little bit about Imarsat. I was involved in the design of the space segment user charges. Bring it on. So I did. And I looked at the data and I did the analysis. And historically, the charges of Inmarsat have been declining year on year. The space segment user charges, they, they call them resource user charges now, but fundamentally it's a, it's a product of bandwidth and power that generates a cost or a price. So this contractor was suggesting you know, costs are going up because everything goes up. There's inflation, there's this, there's that. You're going to have to pay more. But that wasn't the reality of history, and it certainly wasn't the reality of the future. This forecast was correct. And that savings wedge was delivered. It was over 110 million pounds, I say, for the MAD with that analysis. And I'll never forget that day of the negotiations. It was probably one of the most satisfying. It was this uh, sales director had a reputation for being really tough. It was, I mean, it's funny when you think of the MAD and, you know, this is a defense force after all, they should be tough, but the civil servants weren't necessarily that uh, robust, shall I say. And the supplier really had the control. And so I set up the negotiating meeting in one of the special huts that the MOD have with the rear facing windows so that the sun was in the supplier's eyes, just like a World War II fighter pilot, and set the conditions for the negotiations. And she was flanked by her two engineering experts who knew all about satellite. Okay. And we were debating this. And then it came, she just declared that, look, our costs go up, your prices are gonna go up. I think there's no basis for that. And she said, oh, no, no, it is. Everything goes up. Look, my engineers will tell you all about it. I said, okay, tell me about it. What's your, um, what's your source data? And the engineer says, well, you know, I work with Intelsat and Utilsat. Okay, fine, we're talking about Inmarsat here. What do you know about Inmarsat? Oh, nothing, but I know Intelsat and Utilsat. Okay, this is Inmarsat we're talking here. So why are you referencing in a relevant satellite constellation. And she's there looking at this guy. It was slam dunk, 110 minutes saved to the MAD. It was a good day in the office. We're wrapping up, which you may find as a relief. But I just want to give you a quick closing tour of my journey in space. And I guess through these opportunities, I had the good fortune of witnessing several launches from Kourou for Imarsat satellites and from Cape Canaveral or Cape Kennedy for um, military satellites as well as the um, sh space shuttle. I also had the privilege of meeting this gentleman. Do you recognize him? Okay, somebody does. Yeah, Buzz Aldrin, the second man on the moon. I actually met him twice at two different conferences and uh, a really interesting guy. And I also had the privilege of um, getting him to meet my family and hoping to inspire my little boy to have an interest in space. We also had the chance of meeting the last man on the moon, Gene Cernan. What a nice guy. And he gave a great lecture on the importance of teamwork and how the two crew on the lunar excursion module were vital for the safe landing and ascent of that lunar module on the surface of the moon. And it was a classic case of just how important that cooperation of the two crew were. I've always taken a hands-on approach with um, the work that I do, and certainly with satellite communications, as soon as I got involved with it, I had to play space cadet and um, demonstrate these systems with a hands-on approach. Right. 
lessons learned. There's a lot here. We may need to go through them fairly in a fairly sporty fashion, if you don't mind. So, and there's, there is a little bit of repetition here, but um, I'll try and address some of those. So what were the lessons that were learned? And therefore, E equals MC squared. Oh, right. It's actually a lot easier than that. I think from the early years, and this applies to me, but the, the reason why I'm sharing these with you is if you're not a parent now, you may be in the future, or you may be working with those who are younger than you, or work colleagues, being able to inspire, being able to generate interest is powerful and it's rewarding. And sometimes a hobby can be nurtured into a career. It doesn't have to be. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to. It certainly was true in my case. The other thing is if you're exposed to a position where you have responsibility and you need to be dedicated to delivering a particular outcome or objective, which requires a lot of stamina and endurance. These are really character building. I know these are not necessarily space specific. In fact, they are definitely not space specific, but they are transferable. The other thing is, if you see something that looks inefficient or wrong or doesn't make sense, have the courage to challenge. And also, don't always blindly obey authority. Now, I have to pause now, because that's a really dangerous comment. It's in the context of my flight to Canandra and the experienced senior flight instructor telling me, go and take off with your overloaded aircraft and have a nice day, which would have been the end of it, because I wouldn't be here if I took his advice, absolutely certain. And also chucking a clipboard on a cupboard. That could have gone another way as well. My advice would be certainly look at the situation and assess it very carefully and look at the consequences of not following that authority. It's not a carte blanche to say, don't obey authority, because uh, anarchy creates chaos, and it's probably worse than accepting inefficient processes. But be prepared to challenge. Look at situations. Are there ways of doing things better? And sometimes unexpected events can trigger other opportunities in action. Seize them when they come. Generate them if they don't come. It's amazing how much you get when you give. And when I look back on those public relations uh, presentations that I gave to those communities in uh, Queensland, in Rockhampton, maritime safety lectures, it was rewarding as it was. Just getting the satisfaction of sharing a bit of knowledge, sharing a bit of information that benefited the safety of those mariners. As a byproduct, it raised the profile of my company. And as a secondary byproduct, gave me promotional opportunities in my career, which is another reason why I'm here. I wouldn't have been there otherwise. So. There is a value in lobbying, and there is a value in collaboration. I didn't address it at the time, but when I was pushing through some of those uh, space segment charges initiatives in Inmarsat, remember the investment shareholding that I was representing was 1.6%. Tiny 1.6%, challenging 24.5% of the United States, 12% of the UK, 8% of uh, Germany, and as it went down the stack. So the ownership were in that many people, or that many countries. But it was people. Yes, it's countries, but it's really people. And the psychological factors, the personal factors, relationships do matter, and they do make a difference. I tried to collaborate through cooperation. I tried to collaborate through mutual understanding. I tried to collaborate by identifying and generating common purpose. And it worked a lot of the time, but not all the time. And when it didn't work, I used another form of collaboration, which was building up alliances. And so I built alliances with India, with China, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Brazil and all these little countries, only little in terms of their investment in Inmarsat. So these were guys with one, two, half a percent. In aggregate, for certain votes that we had to make in the board, 
we had nearly 30% voting, voting power. And it really changed the dynamic in the, in the, in the, uh, the board of MRSAT. And we started to push through initiatives that were in the fiduciary interests, in other words, the interests of MRSAT, and not of any individual country or company. And that was a really powerful learning experience for me. So size doesn't matter. If you're a little guy, doesn't mean you need to be subservient, doesn't mean you need to stay little, doesn't mean you can't win. But it needs to be done in the framework of integrity. That always matters. And it does relate to Hungary. And some of you know my pet project on that. Hungary has an opportunity in, in space and with space in general. And that's a topic for another discussion. Planning is so important. Planning was vital to my survival of that aircraft flight from Bankstown to Canoundra. <clears throat> Proper preparation. Planning was essential in getting the forecast right for multiple generations of satellite, both civil and military. Planning was essential in building those collaborative forces. So I would certainly encourage you to be bold, be brave, and ask. I asked for sponsorship for that air race. I got a check for, I think it was $11,000. It was a huge amount of money in those days. Yeah, and I managed to be part of history. And that was a lot of fun. And I also demonstrated subtle, uh, radio communications in light aircraft. Some of these bullets we've already addressed, but um, that second one, opportunity cost. The delays in Immarsat making those decisions on the Immarsat P and ultimately the ICO satellite constellation lost them a lot of time. And I think it was partly, not part, it was certainly a contributing factor to the ultimate demise of their spin off company. If they had launched the services at the time with the right investment and the right proportionality, it would be potentially the dominant satellite player in handheld satellite communications now. And there may not be a need for Starlink. Who knows? We'll never know. But I think the real lesson I got out of this was in these joint ventures, there's a lot of, um, a lot of effort made to preserve your own individual benefit. In other words, growing the segment, growing the segment of the pie, rather than making the pie bigger. And you don't need to be a mathematics whiz to figure out that if your segment remains the same and the pie gets bigger, you will prosper. And if the pie grows significantly large enough, even if your pie segment shrinks, you still are substantially better being part of a bigger pie, which comes through collaboration. It's a really powerful message and a lesson that I learned. In all my years of negotiations, and I have to say I've been very fortunate to have an almost perfect strike record with all the negotiations I've been involved with, I would say the number one winning factor is knowledge. The guy who knows more wins. If you have greater intelligence you're going to win the negotiation battle. And don't allow irrational emotions to drive decisions. Fear of missing out is not a reason for doing things or not doing things. <clears throat> Certainly my experiences with uh, forecasting satellite services, history is not always a valid predi predicator of the future. I think that is so true, especially today. Because if you think about all of the characteristics that worked in the past, how many of them will still be valid today and in the future? There are so many disruptive socioeconomic and technological factors. I would hate to do forecasting for a satellite now, really. It was tough then. Think about it, you're forecasting 16 plus years into the future. The way to test that is just stop and think 16 years ago, would you have accurately predicted the world we're in today. Would there be Starlink? Would there have been COVID? Would there be Ukraine? Would there be Brexit? Would there be Trump? You know, and you could go through a huge, huge list of things. Um, the retirement of the, um, the Concorde, the retirement of the space shuttle. You know, all of these things, historically, 
very few of them you would have predicted. So going forward, especially now with AI and LLM, I think anything is possible in the future. When looking at these sorts of technologies, satellite communications technology in particular, there is a factor called user cooperation. It's something that mobile phone users, cell phone users, sometimes experience. You know, we have to go outside the building and look for a signal or climb a mountain. That is certainly the case with a lot of satellite communication systems where you need line of sight for the spacecraft. It is a factor in designing and driving the adoption and use and utilization of these systems. User cooperation. Sometimes you will get user cooperation, you know, with people to cooperate. Sometimes you won't. And there are use cases where it's not possible. Fundamentally, it's taking into account human factors. Because we're building technology for humans, not for technology's sake. I think I've touched on a few of these already, but the, the value of establishing a business presence in another country really does need those connections. The relationship connections, but also the cultural connections. Um, I've I, I stopped counting the number of countries I visited when I hit about 30, 30 odd. So it's something beyond that now. Each of those experiences generated a new appreciation of different cultures for me and language and, and food and entertainment and so many different facets of human life. But the big thing that came out of it was you never know enough. Even cultures that are similar. Uh, you know, going to China and India and Africa and other countries like this, I was always on extra guard to be culturally sensitive. The only countries I've ever got myself into trouble with cultural faux pas were Anglo-Saxon countries, USA and UK, because I think, oh, well, we're all the same. Not necessarily, even in language or in attitudes and beliefs. So the local guy does make a difference if you have access to one. Risk taking, we've talked about, makes sense. PR opportunities generally pay off, um, and giving means you're getting. <clears throat> this aspect about large competitors. Um, okay, from the big corporations that I worked for or did consulting for, we were the big guy. Yeah, and so it was easy to do negotiations. It was whether you're buying or selling uh, because you had the presence. But um, Sometimes there are opportunities for little guys as well. Uh, it really depends on the package. And it's re and big emphasis on package. That's another discussion which we don't have time for. Risks. Now, I've deliberately contradicted myself here because I've said and recommended take risks, but not foolish risks. That antenna repair on the Marinda Pearl could have been my last day on the planet. When I look back at it now, I really hope my son doesn't do anything as dumb as that. Um, it could have been, should have been done differently. But when you're doing planning, and we're talking about traffic forecasting or air flight operations, there are factors that need to be taken into account. But certainly satellite communications today is the lifeline for mariners and aviators and people in remote communities. We covered all those points, but I, I really feel the need to reiterate that last one about end-to-end -end testing. If you're faced in a situation where you're delivering a solution, a product, or an innovation to customers, and there is a single point of failure, even one that's not obvious, look for it. In fact, one of the things that I do with my clients is I, I run through um, the unin unintended consequences test. It's a little bit orthogonal to the end-to-end -end test, but it's in that same space. Most people don't do it. And there's a good reason they're not doing it. It's hard. And it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. And some people feel it's an unnecessary distraction. And in some cases it might be. But if resilience, reliability, quality is important to you and your customers, it is absolutely a worthwhile endeavor. Just go through and just say, if we do this, what happens where it will end up? Test it out. Iridium was backed by Motorola. Motorola invented the mobile telephone. 
Microsoft, the big dominant software operator, um, had the world's first smartphone, or one of the world's first smartphones. I should have brought it with me. Uh, MPX 200. Um, not Apple, not iPhone. But everybody thinks, oh yeah, Apple, Steve Jobs, the smartphone. What Steve Jobs did was he made it commercially viable and commercially successful. But uh, there were others before. <clears throat> now this next bullet is really important in the context of Hungary. And that is, and I'm looking at small to medium enterprises, SMEs, from the lens of a buyer, professional buyer. I've had multiple roles in my career in business development, in sales, in marketing, and in procurement, the other side of the equation. And in my procurement career, we were looking at critical infrastructure. And we had a case in the Metropolitan Police when the, um, trying to think of the right cloaked phrase, the surveillance team, I'll just call them that, or the technology team, wanted a multi-mode, multi-faceted communications uh, vehicle. Every single radio communication system and every single satellite communication system. Basically DC to daylight, as we say in the trade. And there was a company, a small UK company, that made this universal SATCOM terminal. It could tune to any satellite frequency, including military frequencies. And I was tasked with evaluating this. And I gave a very, very firm recommendation. No, do not buy this terminal from this supplier. It was technically excellent. The price was OK. There wasn't really any equivalent. You know, they came up with this brilliant innovation. It was a great piece of kit. And it was just two guys in a garage. That's as small as a small to medium enterprise can be. And that's the reason why I recommended no. Yes, it may be unfair. I'm an SME, and I know a lot of companies in Hungary that are in space as SMEs. But if it's a mission critical piece of equipment, you cannot take that risk. If you bought that equipment and those two guys went bankrupt, choked on a peanut, had a car accident, got drunk and fell off a cliff, whatever happens, um, a meteorite hits their little shed, or they drop a cigarette and it goes into smoke. That's the end of the supply line, that's the end of support, that's the end of parts for that mission, piece of uh, mission critical piece of equipment. And if you're in a mission that is critical and one of those components fails and you need an instant replacement of that part, that's the time when the decision that I recommended would have been considered valuable. And that's how you test these sorts of decisions. It's not about fairness, it's not about equity, it's not about ticking boxes to provide a certain quota of sales to small to medium enterprises, what makes sense. The way to make it make sense is through collaboration. So if those little guys had done some sort of joint venture with a bigger company, they would have had more staff, better premises, diverse premises, access to more resources, materials, and funding, that would have been a different proposition. I would have firmly recommended that. Because then those risks would have been mitigated. I think I've emphasized the, uh, a lot of these bullets already. Um, yeah, preparation, analysis, data, are you winning? You're winning weapons in a negotiation exercise. And it does make a difference every single time. It's facts, not opinions, that gives you the, the edge. With user requirements, uh, we're coming to the end, so you'll be pleased to know. Um, speaking the customer's language in every, in every respect, whether it's the, the language of the nation or the language of their understanding. So if you're talking to business people, you've got to talk in business terms. They're not interested in the technical jargon. They want to understand the technical jargon. Similarly, the decision makers, who are the bean counters and the financiers, okay, oh, sorry, if you're talking to the technical people, they won't necessarily appreciate the financial issues. So you've got to talk to the right level in the common language. And sometimes being able to broker the two is 
the way to harmonize a great idea with a great business solution. And through structured workshops, which I've run quite a few of, you can get that common, common purpose, common understanding, which is essential to getting those things through, making sure that you've got a fit for purpose solution that meets the right requirement. Right. What does the world look like? From an Aussie that worked in the UK and now lives in Hungary by choice and loves living in Hungary by choice. Sorry, I hope that sounds all right. Um, I just love it here. Yeah, it's, I think I've learned over the years, it is a small world. But each piece of the world is different but it's the same. And the way to do that is close your eyes, grab a fistful of dirt and just look at it. It's dirt. Yet we somehow like to see differences amongst ourselves. And I think there's an opportunity for humanity, sorry, this is the deep and meaningful philosophical comment that I'll make. Look for commonality, look for common purpose. You get better results. So, to wrap up, having Travelled all over Australia by air, sea and land, train, motorcycle, pretty much every form of transport except the camel, I've appreciated that over these vast distances, long range communications is vital for safety and convenience. And today, satellite provides that link across a nation around the world. And I'm very pleased and proud to have played a small part in that revolution of providing satellite communications to people in many nations. <clears throat> However, before satellite, and even before this primitive telecommunication system, there was another telecommunication system in operation in Australia that worked for thousands of years and didn't need a battery, and it worked very effectively. It's called a bull roarer ancient Aboriginal communications technology. <sighs> so, like all technologies, it does have its glitches. But uh, yeah, a bit more R&D may be needed there. So I am going to conclude now. And I'm going to preempt a question before we go to the question session. And that is, if you were to ask me, what was the most important job I've had in my career? I have a really quick, instant answer for that. The most important job I've had in all my life was being a father and being a dad, um, that is something that traveling around the world, meeting ministers, solving huge problems and saving companies millions, millions of dollars, pounds, um, is nothing compared to this. So um, I'm now ready to take your questions. I just remember uh, you mentioned that uh, being a uh, father is uh, the biggest job of your life. Um, did it influence, uh, I mean, the experience you had as a father, did it influence uh, how you work, how you uh, performed in the in, in company, in the workplace? So, did the uh, other two have influence uh, on, on each other? Thank you for your question and your kind comments. And I think, yes, it did. It influenced and it impacted and it caused me to reflect. I spent a lot of time away from my family because of the nature of my work. Um, I lived, in fact, people, I, my joke, my standing joke is um, I'm used to getting out of somebody else's bed, you know, it was a hotel bed um, for most of my life. And 
I lost a lot of days watching my son grow up, which is why I think it's such an important job. And the days when I was home, that's it. It was totally devoted to him and my wife. And in my day-to-day -day conduct at work, there were opportunities when um, I would look at a situation and think of a, a bigger picture and a greater good and try and harmonize that with the business objectives or the mission objectives. So it, it just created another dimension. I wouldn't say it was dominant because that's not being authentic or realistic, but when it was relevant and when it was present, it did. Um, yeah. Um, there were times when I thought I might regret all that time away from home, but I think that's a stupid thought. And I try not to have that thought because regrets are pointless. I think, you know, we have a limited amount of time in our lives, we have a limited amount of energy, and I think that time and energy should be devoted to things that can change or make change. Unless somebody has come up with a time machine that can go backwards, then that's pointless. So it was what it was, and it is what it is, and what will be is up to you. So the way I addressed your question is that when those opportunities presented itself for me to shape the future for benefit, whether it was economic benefit, humanitarian benefit, or for technical benefit, yes, I would seize that and put all my energy into that. And it was very rewarding. We actually joined in this question. Uh, I suppose your son is growing up. But uh, yeah. what is he doing? Uh, do you think you have influenced some of that? Thank you for the question. I think parents always have an influence, absolutely. Uh, he will be 20 on, fr on Friday, next Friday. And, uh, okay, I'm trying to compose myself here. He wants to be an engineer. He's enrolled in a Dutch university. We wanted him to study here, but um, my wife is Hungarian and she moved to Australia when she was 19. I moved to the other side of the equator, so our family is across the equator. So it would be hard for us to compel him to stay in one country, so he's chosen a, a university in the Netherlands to study mechanical engineering. Uh, his passion is sailing, and he is a professional sailor now. Uh, in fact, he teaches sailing at the Bolotong, both yachts as well as uh, small dinghies for children. Uh, and it's a passion that we share. And I'm very happy with the career that he's chosen. And yeah, I would encourage the youth. So for sure, I think we have a responsibility to inspire, motivate, and uh, create an educated youth in your own home, in your own family, in your own city, in your own nation. Please make more smart kids. Can't have too many. I have another question. In the last couple of the presentation, in the advice session, uh, you mentioned that uh, do not uh, rely on uh, some for the uh, for which I could, uh, uh, support, uh, whatever. It doesn't include also software, and uh, if there's a company who's a small enterprise and uh, they'd like to uh, I'm so happy you asked that question because I, I really should have reinforced that point quite strongly. It, it is deliberately contradictory. Uh, and I think when you're younger, it certainly wasn't the case in my, in, in my youth. You look at things didactically. In other words, there's choice A and B. Black, white. One, zero. When you start getting grey whiskers, well, you won't. I hope you won't. Uh, um, you do see things in shades of grey. And in fact, right now, I see there are very few binary situations in life. So there's never one just A or B answer. Sorry for that long introductory introduction to the answer, but for software it's a lot easier than hardware, for obvious reasons. Um, it can be reverse engineered, it can be replicated, um, 
the intellectual property and the knowledge can be shared far easier than a manufacturing process. And also the uh, regeneration opportunities are a lot easier with software than with hardware. However, I'm not, I, I would really hate for anyone in this room or watching this um, presentation to get the impression that small to medium enterprises can't succeed in developing initially on their own. That's not the case. In fact, the opposite. I would strongly encourage you to absolutely push and deliver your business and you will succeed. But you must make sure that all of the success factors are understood and all the success factors are executed and executed well. And the takeaway from that is it's not just the technology. You need to do all the business things, all the business critical things, funding, marketing, promotion, and, and, and legal compliance and all the other things that go with it. Not to be defocused from the technology, that's important. You need to build your good thing, whether it's software, hardware, um, but the other facets cannot be ignored. Regrettably, um, only 5% of startups succeed. And the reason why they don't have a bigger percentage of success is because they ignore those factors. And it's a real shame because you know, smart people doing smart things should succeed. And the thing is you can succeed, but keep balance. And if software is what you're doing as a small business, please do so. Um, and I have no doubt that you'll be successful.